Welcome to Movie of the Year, the only podcast that has the science and the screaming to unequivocally figure out what the best movie is of any given year. This season we're digging into 1975, and this week in your bonus episode, we're trekking through the man who would be king. I'm your host, your Sherpa. Is that cultural appropriation if I say your Sherpa? <laughs> man, if, let's just get started with it. Let's just start doing it. <laughs> I'm your guide through these treacherous mountains, Mike Gravania. And with me, as always, is you already heard his voice, Movie of the Year regular, Greg. I am here, ready to talk about this movie and have a good time with my friends. Also, we have with us Movie of the Year regular, Ryan. I am also here and a regular. And... I am currently regular. Okay. You've been taking the medication the doctor said you should take? Well, I tell the doctors what I should take, and I finally did it. You finally told them what you should take. And yes. And it was mostly agreed. opiates, which makes you regularly not pooping. That stuff really backs you up. With us as irregular, and I hope she isn't, is the Unnatural 20 Zone books. I can't say I've ever had quite an intro like that. Um, might be a new <laughs> favorite. I am here irregularly, um, but in all other things, very, very regular. I'm pleased Good. I'm say. glad we all know how everybody's doing <laughs> right now. What Wait, is we super didn't, regular? We didn't talk about Greg's pooping. Oh, Greg, how oh, you pooping? Yeah. yeah, honestly. How you pooping, baby? Uh, everything's going really well. You guys know I'm into intermittent fasting, and I've been really emphasizing uh, my hydration lately. And together, that's kept everything a okay. Feels racist. <laughs> <laughs> honestly this whole week has felt like a little iffy i have to say just this is a racist week can we just chalk it up no matter who or where or how you are the man who would be king john houston angelica's dad wayne's son i don't remember his it's a dynasty wayne newton's son wayne newton houston's son the man who would be king i'm gonna start in alphabetical order books Overall, how are you feeling about this movie? I'm um, I'm feeling a little bit misled, and that is because this movie was pitched to me as a delightful romp. <laughs> and I have some strong feelings about whether or not we could absolutely classify this as anything delightful. So, can you argue that it is a romp? It is. It is indeed a romp, but uh, okay. delightful might not be my adjective of choice. Roger Ebert is a bastard in that way, in how he described this movie. <laughs> Greg? Yeah, I did something I never do, which is after I watched this movie, I was like, I have to read the reviews of this movie. Because uh, if I had to if I had to sum up this movie in one word, it would be vile. This is a vile <laughs> movie. It's disgusting. Uh, and I figured all of the reviews at the time would be like, this is just racism, the movie. And instead, they're like, what a rip-roaring good time, man. These guys are just out there, and they're just in the boonies, and like, there are a whole bunch of hijinks happen. And you know what? In the end, they're gentlemen, and that's what counts. And I, I, like, I can't wait. I'm so looking forward to the show, both so I can just complain about this movie, but also we can arrive at like what the what is it trying to do? What's it trying to be? Movie, what's the point of you? Like A delightful romp, I think. <laughs> this is what it's trying to do. Ryan? I thought it was a delightful oh ride. I knew you would, because who's racism? The panelist, it's Ryan. Uh, no, I would say that this is uh, this is a movie that is hard to recommend to people, I would say. <laughs> sure. Uh, like your racist a, grandpa, you know why you love him. Right. I, I would say that, yeah. I would say that I this is like the racist grandpa. this country might love this movie though actually like i this is the kind of movie that i feel like half this country would be like they don't make them like this anymore actually both sides mm -hmm. would say that but they would ha they would mean different things <laughs> but i i do think that there's a lot to talk about with this movie i do think yes. it is interesting as a sort of antique and interesting as sort of like sort of where we were with filmmaking before 75 mm -hmm. and where we're at with filmmaking in 75 uh, I think there's a lot of stuff going on here, and I don't. I don't think, as much as I don't think that it's like recommend this to anybody and let them have an adventure on their couch. Uh, I do think that there is a lot of really good stuff here that may be tainted by racism, and uh, what's not delightful and romp like is, I think, interesting to talk about. That you just described America, my friend. 
<laughs> America is no Not longer America's interesting to talk, to, talk about. Racism. Uh, my my issue with this movie, if, to to move away from the racism, which I'll go on. I do have a I do I do have a problem with as well. Uh, <laughs> but kind of expected Brave. that. But is uh, I don't think it's enough in any direction. It's never funny enough. It's never dramatic enough. It's never adventurous enough. Yeah, like what? But what's it, it, what's the it point of it? Drags. What's it doing? <laughs> And so maybe, yeah, maybe that's what you're, what's the point of it? Because at any point in any given scene, I'm like, if you just tweaked two notches this way, two notches that way, and especially with the actors they got, you could crush different moments, but it really felt paint by numbers with like, we just got to do this, right? And then to learn that it was a passion project. All right, we've come too far. We got to dive just right in. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, actual discussion about the man who would be king. Hey guys, thank you so much for listening so far. And let me just tell you that everything ahead of this commercial is much better than what came before it. That's my guarantee. While I have you here, let me tell you about a website. It's called yourpopfilter.com. And it's everything you need that's related to Pop Filter. Everything Mike, everything Ryan, everything Greg, everything Cassie, everything is there at yourpopfilter.com. While you're there, go to yourpopfilter.com slash Amazon. Make that your new Amazon bookmark and do your shopping from there. That way we get a little piece of the action and Amazon doesn't. Make sure you're also listening to everything that Pop Filter has to offer, which includes the Superhero Show Show, a podcast that covers every single TV show that's based on a comic book or comic book property, and Movie of the Year, where we sit down and try and figure out what is the single greatest movie of any given year. That's Superhero Show Show, that's Movie of the Year, and that's YourPopFilter.com. Rate, subscribe, review, bye! The man who would be king follows two ex-British soldiers turned con men, Peachy and Danny, played by Michael Caine and Sean Connery, respectively. (laughs) That Sean Connery was McGruff the Crime Dog. (laughs) Sean Connery, only you can stop. The forest fires? (laughs) Forest crimes. Forest crimes are also important. My name's False Crimes. <laughs> no, that was more JFK. Two, these two guys decide India's getting too civilized and ruling, so they decide to smuggle guns into Kafiristan and take as much power as they can. Turns out that much power means one of them becomes a god king and the other builds a bridge. It does not go well for them or their friendship. Or the bridge. Director, or the bridge, which really bummed me out most of all. <laughs> Director John Huston had been trying to adapt the 1888 Richard Kipling novella for years, originally with Clark Gable and Humphrey Bogart in the roles of Daniel and Peachy. But then they died before he got his shit together. Next up, he approached Richard Burton and Peter O'Toole. And then in the 1970s, he approached Robert Redford and Paul Newman. Newman said, hey, Brit should play Brits. And I'm sure no one said anything about who should play the citizens of Kafiristan. <laughs> The movie expanded the role of Billy Fish, played by Saeed Joffrey, to become Danny and Peachy's loyal interpreter, and turned the unnamed narrator of the original story into Kipling himself, played by Christopher Plummer. When looking for the perfect Roxanne, who Houston described as the absolute heir princess, he met Michael Caine's wife Shakira at dinner, and the role was locked. The movie is 97% on Rotten Tomatoes, and both Caine and Connery considered it their favorite to work on of all their lengthy careers. Taste buds, I ask you this. Despite a Hall of Fame director and a classic author, does enjoyment of the man who would be king depend solely on how much you enjoyed these two knuckleheads together? And regardless of how much you enjoyed it, is the movie making the argument that they're heroes? First of all, how did we, like, after Mike said Kane and Connery's name, he said so many other names with no Mike impression. Where, when are we going to get our bogey and our gable, Mike, and our Peter oh. O'Toole? Okay, I thought you wanted, like, Shakira Kane or Cy Joffrey. I'm like, no, but this is Peter O'Toole. Okay. Right? Okay, Pretty right. dead on? Yeah. I think that was a cross between Peter O'Toole and Peter Lorre. But keep going. <laughs> <laughs> Every Peter sounds the same to me, and it is Peter Lorre. Uh, who else? Bogues? Bogey. Here's looking at you, kid. All right, let's move on. That was pretty good, actually. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. That's what he would sound like today. Yeah, okay, so the the, the let's talk about the characters just for one second. Are they are they ultimately supposed to be heroes? For so much of the movie, I would argue no. The movie was accurately portraying them as dirt bags. Yeah, but then when you're when you're like when your two leads say we're gonna go take these guns and then overthrow a small village and install someone as a king and then overthrow him and leave it in chaos, 
That's the movie presenting no, they did. these two guys as bad, right? It, it, to me, it undersold. It was Plummer's look at the end of the story. It wasn't like, you fuckers. He was just like, oh, you gentlemen bastards. Yeah, it, oh, my goodness. Plummer's look through the entire movie is like, what the fuck is going on? And Peachy, But with respect. Peachy <laughs> goes out like a hero. Like, at the end of the movie, they march out like gentlemen. They march out of this, mm-hmm. civiliz- this little town that they've like basically started to destroy. They march out like gentlemen. Um, Billy runs into the crowd. He's like, I won't run anymore. I'm going to fight them. And it's just torn apart by the crowd. Uh, and then, um, Danny, Danny like sings like with, with pride on the bridge as he's like killed. Ultimately, doesn't the movie like laud these well, guys? Yeah. Aren't they shown in a finally heroic light? I feel like I'm more heroic because I'm still alive. <laughs> <laughs> You're the peachy of it all. But Oops. I mean, like he's not going to have a good life. Well, no. it's like even... Before they like march to their death, too, they have that like noble, like, I forgive you for just being this awful human being moment, too, which seems like a moment where they're trying to be like, white people mm, but at forgiving heart. white people. <laughs> so but, look but, at these- nobody else will, Greg. <laughs> That's the whole thing of it, though, is that the whole movie is uh, the entire run of Entourage, where the first half <laughs> is like, wouldn't it be cool to hang out with these guys? And then the whole back half is like, oh my God, fuck these fucking guys. <laughs> This is fucking terrible. Even fucking Billy Turtle. Billy Fish. Oh, sorry. He's not an amphibian. Get it right. But in part, I found the two guys so loathsome that it actually took two actors that I like quite a bit. I love both of these mm. guys. And if you told me they were, they, you know, they were going to be the stars of a movie, which I guess you did kind of, then I was like... <laughs> which is not something we really get in 1975. Yeah. I was so excited to see it. But it's like, they're self-evidently loathsome but the movie doesn't seem fully aware that they are and they play right. it something in between their natural occurring wit and like these weird kind of like macho and i i read the short story today novella I pick. Right? Uh, i'm sorry it's a novella really okay i might have read something very abridged then okay uh, i was gonna say like you, <laughs> you read you read the back of a novella <laughs> um there is nothing about like cheeky banter in the novella like they are they, i mean like it's you know it's you know there's a narrator and they're just telling about these plights the dialogue is sparse and the the john houston michael kane sean connery of it all of the blah 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 blah, blah, blah that is all added for the movie well yeah Rudyard kipling was not known as like a witty bant kind of guy. But see, here's the thing is that I think that Houston wanted to do something more modern or postmodern than what he had originally planned with Bogey and Gable. I think that was the intention. And Gee. then he gets Kane and Connery, mm-hmm. or as I call him, Canary. And <laughs> sure, he, Canary. And uh, it just... It, I, I think that that is the issue with the movie is that I think that Houston wants to do something that is ready, you know, like... I've learned a lot in my life. I'm almost 70 years old. I want to do something that does talk about how awful all of these movies were that I made in the past. And then he's like, but I'm still going to cast two da- uh, ravishing leads and I'm still going to shoot the shit out of it and I'm going to make it look awesome. And bitch, you're doing the same thing. You're making them heroes. Is it is it Tyler Durden theory? Like, Absolutely. he got caught up in yes. how cool, so he forgot what he was supposed to be doing? Absolutely. That's I, I I'm at least glad to hear that it, they do seem like jerks to other people because it it feels like the movie can't digest whether or not it wants to say colonialism is bad. It seems at, at, it seems like it might have an extremely darker, more cynical message, which is like, yeah, colonialism is bad, but honestly, these places are so fucked anyway. What does it matter? Like people are just like bad everywhere you go. That's like mm-hmm. the most optimistic reading you can give the movie. Yeah. What what I found, if we're trying to be optimistic, what I found interesting is looking at it because they are they love each other and Plummer wishes he could be them as he kind of looks down upon them. But and I think if Billy Fish was the eye the eye of the story, that would be interesting because here's a guy who I know went but- through a lot, has dealt with British people, but he seems so pure of heart that. It does feel like the movie takes his view of them. But if you look at most other people they deal with, like the the high priests and Roxanne, they're like, these fucking dirtbags. But we don't get a lot of time with them. We mostly get these two guys being like, it's, it's, I get, Ryan and I think Ryan and I are the coolest, funniest guys to hang out with. But I know what other Borderline people Borderline Connery. Do, but people we don't know at bars, how they view us. And it's how the high priests and Roxanne view 
Kane and Connery in this movie. Did you guys see yourself in these two characters? These guys? I don't want to. <laughs> they're like they're their own little state everywhere they go. It's just the two of them, and no matter where else they go, it's just like the buddy and, system. And Kafiristan is the podcasting world, and we're taking it by storm <laughs> with guns. That is very problematic, Ryan. <laughs> I know you're gonna have to apologize for that later. Never. I will later. Um. The, I mean, the problem with Billy Fish, though, is that uh, he is he is more likable than them, but mm-hmm. he does have this thing of like almost more tutorious, you know. I I think that the it, the movie from his point of view would have been a better movie or would have had more nuance because maybe we would have seen a little bit of guilt. But I think what the movie actually does, and this might be too sly, you know. Like I have heard that this movie doesn't do any one thing correctly or a, enough of one thing as much as it should. But I think the thing that we're looking for is when Kane and Connery smirk. And Mm -hmm. every time they smirk, that is a death knell. That is when Houston's like, oh, you motherfuckers. You have either raised the ire of the race that you think is lesser than or the gods who you believe don't exist. But it's, it's Kane smirking as he counts gold or Connery smirking as he gives down decrees of like as judge judy and executioner uh (laughs) that smirk that they have is go is how they're going to meet their fate you know that's what that's how this movie stands on this side of Mm -hmm. in in how they inhabit their roles books how do you feel these two like legends of cinema do i mean i think they're legends for a reason they inhabit it kind of i want to go back to what ryan said um I'm trying to collect my thoughts because I think I disagree with that a little bit. Judge but Judy I, and Executioner? Yeah. Are you saying that that's not a real phrase? <laughs> it's more Night Court and Executioner? In that, yeah, like every time they smirk, it's like, oh, it's coming to you. But alternatively, in that viewing them as the hero, they did get what they wanted at the end. They just didn't get it for the longevity that they wanted because their alternatives were going back to England and being dirt poor and working shit jobs and never getting recognition for like their service in the military or helping England colonize another country. So if you look at it like from that perspective, like, yeah, they died before they wanted to or not on their own terms, mm-hmm. but they still lived out what their goal was for a brief period of time they did it the best it could have actually been one of them was thought to be a god for a while but if you think about how long to betray their best friend because power goes to their head (laughs) okay that's weird if you think about how long this movie is it was for a very short amount of time yeah but the the adventure the anticipation of it all is part of it it's like sex it's like sex like it's like sex. It's like uh, talking about the screenplay you want to write. It's more fun to <laughs> in terms of running talk time about in the movie, which is probably what's important. It is a short time, but it's within the world of the story. It's a, it's a fairly long time because one yeah. of them has a chance to leave and then come all the way back. And it seems like mm-hmm. he, you know, uh, Danny stays in power for at least a little bit. Is it like is- enough to go to his head? That, I, I think that's part of it. Is like I I, I think they are great actors. Uh, but it's the movie, the way it is paced, they didn't have enough time to show. He didn't go full Apocalypse Now the way he should have, Connery. Well, uh, because it was like 10 minutes of the actual movie that he was God King. And so when co- he was like, hey, you should bow. It's like, okay, that's step one. And then we get step two and never to step 10 where we should get. That's true. And the other thing, too, is that these might be great. These are probably great actors, right? Like, yeah. they might one be great actors. Is. But <laughs> what, we are, what we're seeing now is great stars. Like, they... Mm. That's the thing is that like I think that this there is was, Ocean's Eleven in every version. Kind of yeah, like they, there was this initial message of like we don't want to make the movie that we would have made in 1949. You know, we want to make it like now, and so we want to say some things. And then they hired people who like could not keep their like their star personas down. No one mm-hmm. believes that this is two people who are in this time wearing these uniforms. They are straight up these people being like, "What? This is crazy." It's Bill and Ted. It's Bill and Ted <laughs> go okay. to the Dan. You, you, I want to see the remake with that. And you know who it should be, Ryan? It should be the two from what is it, Fun and Games or Funny Games? Like oh, that's yeah. what these two really like. They should remake this movie and have those two guys just be psychopaths because that's uh-huh. really... the, the Dutch version or the American remake. But you, you want Michael Pitt in it. Either way, we need that time for, with that. Like that's the thing is that it didn't go too far, and that's why I think that mm-hmm. Houston had good intentions and bad results is because he couldn't stop himself from making a hilarious adventure movie and so we don't see them looking in the mirror going you're the king 
You're the fuck. Right. You're a god. You're a god. Like I do every morning. And so what you fe- what you get is it, almost a scene by scene tone change, where like you're not sure how you're supposed to feel about them or about what they're doing mm-hmm. or about the land they're in, and. It, there was just no authorial voice that came in and said, no, this is exactly what we're going for here. And that missed opportunity is like, I think magnified in this movie because what it leaves in its place is something that's just like, has almost no redeeming. But as value. Mike said, it's just somebody reading heart of darkness and just stripping all of the boring pages out, you know, like this <laughs> no. is, this is too like thoughtful about the, uh, like what a man goes through or what a human goes through in order to absolutely go insane, which these two totally did, yet maintained their Kane and Connery cool the entire time. Uh, we're going to throw all those pages away. And so we have stars the whole time. And you just, you can't, God does not give movies with both hands. Like you can't be as thoughtful as this movie thought it was going to be and also as rompy as it turns out to be. We must take a break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about the 1975 of it all. Hola, Felterinos. I just wanted to interrupt real briefly and say thank you for listening. Thank you for your support. If you want to support us a little more directly, you can go to patreon.com slash yourpopfilter. There, depending on what tier you pick, $1 a month, $5 a month. If you're crazy, anything more than $5 a month, don't do that. You can get extra content. There's extra shows, extra series, uh, behind-the-scenes stuff. Uh, You could pay for Ryan to draw you a picture. Uh, I can write you a poem. You can get the shirts off our very own backs. All of that and so much more over at patreon.com slash your pop filter. While you're on the internet, you should check out Shady Monk. He does all the tunes you've been listening to. He's on Bandcamp. He's on Spotify, uh, SoundCloud, wherever kids get their music these days that I'm too old to know. Shady Monk lives there. Uh, You can probably follow him on Twitter and Instagram as well. That's Shady Monk. Wherever you get music, check him out. Taste buds. Between the look, structure, and feeling of the film, this ain't new Hollywood. This is an old school studio adventure. What about this movie does feel 1975 or feels that 1975 needed it? I'm not saying that Greg and McKenna are wrong, Mike. I know how racist this movie is. Please let me in with them. Oh, I'm not saying that Greg McKenna and Mike are wrong, Mike. You don't often hear people asking to be lumped in. I would like to be lumped in with with the wrong side of the argument, too. I'm just saying, can we imagine, if I'm right, and I do think that John Houston was trying to do something that, like, he wouldn't have, can we imagine if he had made this movie at any of the other points than he tried to make it? I think this movie would be worse. Even, like, Quentin Tarantino is going around saying that John Ford is the worst director of all time, and that is because the treatment of Native Americans in his movie. Mm -hmm. And I get that, but it feels a little woke. It feels a little, like... uh, Famous woke guy Tarantino. But, I mean, like, what he's trying to do is, like, make up for, you know, lost time. Is right. That, uh, this guy who has definitely influenced his career or influenced people who have influenced his career, uh, he's going around and saying this guy has has zero filmmaking ability because mm. Native Americans were treated poorly. And he's pulling from movies where in <laughs> literally every movie that came out that year, even if it was, like, a gangster movie, treated Native Americans poorly. You know, right. like, I don't know what we do with that information. This movie is... The whole country, uh, really. You, I think you could give a real low grade. <laughs> and yeah. that country, we're talking about Canada, right? Because they're <laughs> yeah. on the hot seat right now. Oh, shit, days. yeah. Um, we're but fine. yeah, I mean, I, I do think that, like, there are there is some not great stuff here, I guess. <laughs> Where was I going? Where uh, was I going we're talking this? about 75 of yeah, it all. They're not, they're not, oh, uh, okay. Well, well, so, uh, okay. the 75 of it all is it to make it a little bit postmodern, a little bit like the Unforgiven of its time. A little bit, not enough. Uh, My issue is, so, uh, Bing Crosby and Bob Hope made a bunch of Road 2 movies, The Road to Bali, The Road 2. I think the two of them would have made a better postmodern, and they're, it's a ha- they're hacky, they're bad movies with bad people in them, but they would have made a better... The man who would be king. The road to the man who would be king. The road to Kafiristan would have been a better postmodern take and show what dirtbags these guys are than this version did. It, yeah, I just... Go ahead, go ahead. It feels like in the 60s and 70s, pop culture was trying to tell us not to get involved in Afghanistan. 
Like this, the other, the the. If you look at the entire history of Afghanistan, it's told us to not get involved. In yeah, but I mean specifically, man. like like Dune comes out in the '60s, right? And it's all about you know what a boondoggle Afghanistan is for Russia. And then this movie comes out, and it it seems like you know oh yeah, colonialism wasn't very effective in Afghanistan. And then 25 years later, America's like, I'm going in. <laughs> now it's going to be my shot. And it is, I, I think, kind of timely that like the last American military presence in Afghanistan just left like three days ago. And we're, we're watching this movie that is about like mm-hmm. what a difficult geopolitical situation Afghanistan. Well, that's is. Afghanistan. This is Kafiristan. So. Yeah, but isn't it like a little hat know. on top yeah. of Afghanistan? Yeah, Greg, this is just mm-hmm. the very northeastern part of Afghanistan. Very yeah, I don't know if this counts, Greg, what you're saying. Although maybe, I guess that is, that, that's part of the problem, right? Is that this movie projects like a people as all being the same. And I guess my comment right. is doing the same thing, which is just like, well, they're in Afghanistan. Like, well, no, they're, they're in Kavirstan. <laughs> they're in their own Well, the, 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 was it the Treaty of Versailles that just fucked up the entire world? It was just white people from all over going, ah, here's carving out territories and these people have never been and it always, together so why would they be a country it always feels, and all hip-hop will start my name is blank and i hear to say <laughs> and it feels like this movie is always on the cusp of making that point without right. ever really fully again we're just going to the same thing but without ever fully committing to it the 1975 idness of it to me i think is just that like maybe that lack of center is very 1975 like who in this story can you look at as an exemplar who is in control of the situation who is really like demonstrating moral courage and leadership there's nobody right it's a total vacuum and 75 loved its question marks but greg i fucking i will bet so much money that the thing that it's the thing that you said earlier of you said that you read like critics and they were like this is the best movie ever they were so desperate for old school hollywood <laughs> they hit, they had watched. I just so don't many want fu- questions. Yeah, they had watched so many Nashvilles over the last like three years, and they were like, "Look at this movie, Sword versus Sword. I love it." I'll, I'll, I'll. T- do you know what worked, or it seemed 1975 is uh, Danny Sean Connery's character does flip where in the beginning he seems like the more grounded one. They're offered boys. They're like, "Do you guys want our women?" And they're like, "No." Paint does a spit take. We signed this contract, and then they're offered boys, and and Danny's just like chill out it's a different culture i'm woke i don't know what your deal is and then but again that's what i'm what i said earlier it's not enough if like it really nailed into his arc of trying to appreciate these folks and then being like nope i'm your god king you know, that would be a dope movie you know what fucking culture does that hollywood culture like being offered girls and boys that's like that's hollywood like the, this is like <laughs> this is why the the movie is fulfilling like that what Saeed says is like the othering right mm-hmm. it is pointing a finger it's just randomly pointing a finger on a map and being like these people do sex with kids and it's like we know that's a huge problem in Hollywood we know that like that is something that Hollywood tries to point that other people do sorry I, got yeah. of, I, I just hate this movie so much you guys <laughs> it's got a lot of lack of self awareness mm-hmm. but it's even more ironic that it points at the exact issue that it's not aware of its own and still never sees a problem or it is aware it's just bad at showing that Dude, the 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 most aware i think it shows is when the line that's echoed in my head that did make me laugh i liked it, is you'll be able to stand up and slaughter your enemies like civilized men that is the one <laughs> point five seconds that the movie fully had its tongue in its cheek and it's like see what we're doing and then it forgot it before and after you know what it is it's just that you can't tell a tale about colonialism without the truth of how awful it is asserting itself even if you don't mean for it to even in times Mm. where you don't mean for it to it is just so antithetical to like moral good that it will find its way into asserting itself in any depiction of it let's talk about one part real quick i don't know if this is the 75 of it all but i want to get this out there uh danny and peachy are fucked like they're dead and then they laugh so hard that it causes an about their mm-hmm. previous exploits, that it causes an avalanche that then allows them to uh, go across the crevasse mm-hmm. and make it to Kafiristan. Mm-hmm. Is, I mean, is this just Kane and Connery like uh, nature is bowing down to their star power, or is this just a, a a mimic of what white people how white people think the world 
that, it is for them. If if we're being generous, and again, if we're saying what Houston was trying to do, it'd be like, look how easy it is for white people. They laugh themselves out of absolute death and into situations and think it was because of their skill. Yeah. We're I mean, not we're even not... talking about race yet. but <laughs> And because it is, it is supposed to be... It, didn't you get the sense reading the novella, Ryan, that it was supposed to be kind of a fun romp? Like... That it's like an adventure. It's a high adventure. You know, it, it's it's Robinson Crusoe, and it's... but everything in the novella is still there. Of like, we are basically demigods. Yeah, and it's really hard to know the difference between. And I, like, I also did some reading about Kipling, and he is like, he is not a fan of people who are not like white or male, <laughs> and like such a huge fan. Yeah, of white dudes, right? Like, I mean, this is guy oh who, god, like, he loves white. Yeah, dudes. he's just like, man, we're everyone is so lucky that white dudes are around. <laughs> Which, Which is, is something that, I, not as I grow up, I don't know if I agree with him. <laughs> well, it's clear what we've wanted to talk about the entire show. And we're going to do it after this break. As we've talked about since before we hit record, the man who would be king has, let's say, a complicated relationship with race. Is there any way to defend the film if not the actions of its two leads? And can something be a tr- critique of colonialism and still be a wretchedly vile racist piece of irredeemable garbage, as I quote one of our panelists? <laughs> that does sound familiar. <laughs> I think definitely something can be um, can, can poke holes in colonialism and, and take issue with colonialism and still be racist, because Heart of Darkness is a perfect example of that, right? Heart of Darkness is about the horrors of colonialism. And then also manages rebels yeah it like it goes out of its way then to be racist like i'm reading about the reconstruction and it united states reconstruction and it's so crazy how often people uh, in that time uh, would be like okay honestly like i'm for the north and they would always have a caveat and then they would say the most racist thing they could possibly think to say like but just so you know that i'm reasonable here's a little racism to get me through right <laughs> and so like you see this a lot, too, when uh, you see, like, liberals sneak into MAGA events and interview MAGA people, like, let's say about uh, critical race theory. And they're like, well, do you think that slavery should exist? And they're like, well, no. But, and like, oh, buckle yes. in. Here, Here we go. a very exciting but. Uh, and so, but I don't think this movie manages to do that. I think that it is so mealy-mouthed in its criticism of colonialism and then just so blithely racist in every single way using both signifiers from the middle east and signifiers from like the american south like i think that there's a way in which this imports actual american racism and puts it into the fantastical realm of like mid-east racism i think that the whole scene where the the guy gets on the train and he's eating Mm -hmm. a watermelon and it's oh shit it's like and he's just like Mm. he keeps saying thank you sir no matter how awful michael Caine is to him I think that that is a, a weird Jim Crow scene in the middle of this movie, which has nothing to do. But then it makes that con- and played for yeah, laughs, and right? then it makes that connection. And when you think of okay, well, then the, then the director is, is John Huston. Like it also, I think, connects to a lot of like Native American racism, and it seems to sort of like create this umbrella racism, like that unifies a whole bunch of unpleasant American ideas all together. Under the guise of maybe commenting on them, can I make you explain the the umbrella, the how it connects to Native American? Like, I get the the, the watermelon bringing in the drink pro style stuff. I understand. I I think that the way in which the mass of Afghani's is uh, sort of portrayed as undifferentiated um, and a almost part of the scenery. Like, that this land comes with some scenery that happens to be people. Mm -hmm. I think that is very much the way in which Native Americans are shown in a lot of Westerns. That, like, Mm. the things you might encounter are a rattlesnake in your boot or a sandstorm or some Indians, right? Uh, And they might... It's just like an element. Yeah, yeah. Like, Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. And not a people, though. Like, not that you're encountering a people. You're encountering, like, a spirit that sort of passes through the land. And I think that that's Mm -hmm. the same... I think that Middle okay. Easterners are refigured and in that same way in this movie. There's I also... think the movie starts off as like something where like Michael Caine is supposed to be disgusting, as disgusting as we think about him right now, and the movie just won't let him be because of how we shoot him and the dialogue we give him. Like he's he, is, he is like so awful in that scene, and then the movie's like, 
Ah, come on. He's white. He's a little handsome for Cockney, I guess, and he's he's kind of funny. He's charming. He's a charming and then scamp. We just we can't have a whole movie about what it's like to be a bad person. That's what everyone else in seventy five was doing, but not this movie. Right. Books. I it just I was building off of Greg's point too, like not even just that we're bringing American racism into it and building off of that, but that all races can be unifiedly like lumped together as lesser and we're not even gonna distinguish which is an American racist but like a British racist thing too. But it continues throughout the mask scene where he asks like what is it, Halloween? Like those are like East mm. Asian masks. They're not yeah. even from India or anything corrected. And it that's not the characters being crappy characters putting that on. That is the movie itself not even doing the ability, like going out and not doing the research. Yeah, and that, and that speaks to the film itself, and not like are these characters shitty people? It's it's close enough. Yeah, it, it was. So a I I want to. Oh, but I, wanna... I do think that's a big thing though. Is that the movie thought it was close enough to not being racist? Mm-hmm. Well, seventy five could be just close enough. Just in seventy five, saying you're one of the good ones was a compliment. Uh-huh. And right. or you like, work. you're well spoken to and say that to Billy a black Fish, dude, you know? right? Billy Fish is quote one of the good ones. He's the one that they're able to mm-hmm. civilize. And what that means is he like betrays his own people and but then mm-hmm. he like marches Can with speak them. English. He he sacrifices. He loses himself. his life. Just, he could have gone celebrity away. worship. Yeah. yeah. Just just loves everything British and thinks it's automatically better. He's like, Oh, you're trying to trick everybody? Cool. I'm full. Yeah, in. sounds good to me. I mean his catchphrase his catchphrase is by Jove. You know, which mm-hmm. is the old school by Felicia. Uh, I want to go around the horn and force you to do something you might not want to do, starting with you books. Defend this film. What is working in this movie? I think this film should be watched for the sake of even when you think you are being progressive, your true racism is going to come out. Good, good start. Defend this film. <laughs> what is working in this film? Um, okay, if I'm going to defend it truly and honestly, the acting I do think is strong. I think there's something about Sean Connery. I think there's something about Mike, Michael Caine that even when I don't think the dialogue was that funny, um, them delivering it had an mm-hmm. element of charisma, which works for it. Um, and even when they're supposed to be either like just not the most intelligent people or just the most hated things that they're doing. Uh-huh. There's an element to them that is still enjoyable to watch because of who they are as actors. And that will make, I guess it possible to continue with. I, I know that was difficult for you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Greg, defend, <laughs> defend this film. Well, I would say it's primary. No, I would say it's primary <laughs> importance is that it helps to capture an idea of what, a 1975 progressive look at race relations was like. And then in so doing it, it also ossifies and collects like these really terrible caustic ideas. And so then we have it presented not as like someone else talking about racism, but as an artifact that is itself employing racism. But that's not exactly defending the film. So I will say this. No, I was going to say the same thing. Defend this film. It seems like, and I don't know this for a fact, but it seems to me like they went and shot a lot of this on location and managed Mm. to capture, um, capture a people and, and exploit the hell out of them i'm sure but uh like put down on film uh some of their cultural expressions and there's a lot of like um a lot of people in the background and, and places that maybe we wouldn't have any american films of at all and i uh you know i think that there's probably some value in that and it wasn't just a bunch of uh white people that they like made to look like Middle Easterners, it was you know as far as I could tell, it looked like um, it looked like they really went to Afghanistan to make this movie. Ryan, I think it might be easier for you to defend this film. And I mean, like pound for pound performance to location shooting, right? Like where it could look hot where the camera is, but have snowy mountains in the background. Like the background just looked amazing. He, yeah, he shot the hell out of the movie too. Like it's 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 very it's beautifully shot. And I think that sometimes that may have tricked him he was like look how well i'm shooting this i'm white <laughs> is this a good movie they're white uh but no i like to defend the movie i would say that we this is a last gasp for a lot of reasons i think it's the last gasp of the studio system before uh, a ton of people went and took over and i think it's the last gasp of like oh you think you're liberal but you don't know you are and that's always going to be a battle you know like there are so many liberal movies that come out today that won't be in you know, 35 years from now or 
45 or however long it's been since 1975, you know, shit will change. I do think that they thought that they were doing a good job. And he's an, he's and so an maybe, old man in 75, right? Yeah. Yeah, he's 69. No comment. He's years old. No shit. comment. Nobody has any no comments? Comment. He's, Zero. Six, he's 69 Zero years old. Zero comment on that one. That's, it's old, but it won't feel old in a few years for some of us. <laughs> <laughs> That's the comment. Um... But no, like uh, I, I do think that uh, I, I'd like to watch the trying here, and I do, I do think it's interesting to see how it's not just because of racism, but because of filmic language, the mm-hmm. way that film works. He was like, "I'm trying to make this even, where or even where like the uh, quote unquote savages are obviously smarter than the imperialists who are trying to take over. That's what I'm trying to do. But mm-hmm. I can't, I can't not make them funny and handsome and shoot them." With mountains in the background, and then ruined his entire movie, and I think that's I, I, that's why this movie stands out. I think a huge part in a, a modern version, like who, who who's like somebody who would try, but if Zack Snyder made this, it'd be way slower. But uh, a modern version would give subtitles and let us hang out with just the priests, and that would open it up a lot more if we could hear them talking shit on and see Peachy their and pre-existing Danny. divisions. And the, oh my goodness, what were they like? Yeah, before exactly. Yes. A, bo- a modern movie would give us. Uh, all all of these tribes and cities versus Jeff Daniels and Jim Carrey. Like yeah. that's how you oh, would have to do it. That okay. I want the Kefir what are those Kefir brothers? Stan? The Farrell brothers? Safety brothers? <laughs> Not the Safety brothers. No, I want the Safety tense. brothers to do this. <laughs> the Farley brothers uh, version of it. Well, that is all the time we have to talk about this movie. Also, did Mike, did you notice that when I said a modern movie, I picked a movie from 1995? That, that yeah, you're a very old man. Yeah. You're the one I was talking about when I said 1969 or being 69 isn't that far for some of us. Yeah, I that understand you. that now. I hope you know. <laughs> nice. When we come back, how would this do in the bracket? <laughs> well, that is very very funny or very sad, and perhaps now you have something to think about, or very problematic, and perhaps we have something to think about. But in any event, I'm sure you have some reaction to what you're listening to. So why not check us out on the social media? You can go to Instagram or Twitter and find us at Your Pop Filter. Email contacts at Your Pop Filter. Hey, everybody. Keep watching them movies. Can you believe that I don't know how many awards The Man Who Would Be King was nominated for? Like five, dude. Like this was... Oh, yeah, four. More, yeah, five. More than we normally give. Normally, it's like, isn't that impressive that we're going to give it awards because it was not... This was award... Maybe it was nominated for two men. Hollywood ate this up. Go to the Wikipedia and look at critical reception. Like you said, it's a ninety-seven percent on on the on the Rotten Tomatoes. That makes me think that if we go back and watch the King speech, we're going to be like, "Oh, this is a horrific movie." There's so many issues with this. This is much better than the King speech. Oh shit! Gauntlet Throne. I disagree. There's no, <laughs> there's no Colin Firth at all in it. All right, but we're giving three away tonight. We're starting with cringe books. What is the cringiest moment of this movie? My um, cringiest moment is chosen because I know it was not meant for um, cringe and the lack of self-awareness really got it for me. And it's the moment where they ask, are you gods? And they say, no, we're English, the next best thing. And it's supposed to be like a joke of like, haha, isn't that funny to the audience? But it's it's that layering of like, but there's a level of you that truly believes that isn't there. <laughs> but yeah, um, doesn't that mean that we're that supposed to hate them? Like, that's proof right yes. there. Yeah, that's that was the intention. But looking at it now from the perspective of knowing the whole film, it's that even the people who wrote that to be ironic didn't realize the true irony of you guys are all still racist as hell and truly do have this element of like white supremacy, like or white superiority. You know, honestly, rather than be self-aware, it feels like this weird sort of alt-right, like almost being flippant or being ironic about your actual feelings, which is like. Yeah, you know, we said, like, it's the next best thing, but that's because we're, like, ripping on ourselves. But it's like, no, wait, you believe yeah. it. Don't try to hide you behind believe the irony. It. You act- I get to say it and until somebody calls me on it. Yeah. And I was like, no, I was, I was being ironic. Oh, you fell for it. You got triggered lib. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to hear Michael Caine say triggered lib ever. <laughs> Greg, cringiest moment. I guess I'm going to go with this guy on the train. The first time I was watching it, I was like, the movie's going to reveal that this guy's in on part of their, like, scheme or something, and he's their, like, savvy friend on the inside, but he knows that a way you can really hoodwink somebody is by playing the, you know, the smiling, cheerful native type. And then it's like, 45 minutes later, you're like, wait, no, that guy is just somebody he roughed up on the train, and, like, who was, like, 
thanking him for it the entire time. I I don't know what the, the point is. I don't like it. It feels bad. The heartbreaking part of that scene is not that he gets thrown off the train because at that point the movie is now a cartoon, right? Like, yeah. like it's it's no big deal. He says thank you, sir, as he's flying off. Like the movie is a cartoon. It's that he gets treated like absolute fucking shit, and then still feels forced to offer a slice of watermelon to this guy. Like, yeah. no, at that point, keep your watermelon yourself and fuck Michael Caine, or throw half of it at his head and knock him out. And it's just like what, take his watch. Why is it a watermelon? I I just don't like it. Like it just all it all feels so bad. And then to like yeah, fair, and then he's like watermelon. Fucks. They try to pin it's a crime so on him, and Rudyard Kipling's like, you know, I know that you that like that that's not how my watch got stolen. But at no <laughs> point, yeah. But at no point is yeah. He he's like, like how charming. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's pointing out the real Rudyard Kipling and what a bastard yeah. he was. <laughs> Ryan, cringiest moment. Uh, cringiest moment for me is is definitely the treatment of Utah. All mm. of the Utah jazz that happens is, I think, the worst part because I think that a lot of the people that they meet are treated not with respect, yeah, not with dignity, but treated. something along treated. They are treated. <laughs> they surely are treated. But this is the time where the movie and the characters come together to say. Fuck this no toothed idiot, and he becomes a goddamn clown. Yeah, and that's the cringiest moment—the kind of clown whose head is a croquet ball. Yeah, and I don't even think that's that's that weird. Like, yeah, I mean, we don't have a soccer ball; we do have this head. Let's use it. I think what's weird is that they just make fun of him until they tell their new people to kill them yeah. to kill him. Those are all good cringy moments. If I had to pick one, it would be uh, when. Kipling first like they're like let's meet up and I'm still I'm at no point except that they want to brag about the sweet plan they've made why they want to hang out with Kipling more mm-hmm. uh, and they're just like in full on brown face just uh-huh. like doing poor Indian impressions and whoo this movie pound for pound performance let's try to be positive starting with you this time Ryan who you got I am going to go with that, Mike. I'm going to go with Christopher Plummer, who had the... Uh, he is new, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, he would eventually go on to star in Robert Wise's biggest hit, Sound of Music. Um, but I would say that he has the performance that is all of us, which is like, I am mildly entertained, but just shocked <laughs> and awed <laughs> by everything that is happening right now. Um, and... I think that he does a pretty good job with very limited lines of mm-hmm. being on the verge of tears, on the verge of clapping. Like, he doesn't know what he's supposed to do as a white writer. You know, because, like, this is the dream thing to land in your lap if you're a writer. But, oh, my God, am I disgusted by both of you. I'm giving so it to Christopher Plummer. Good actor, but didn't do a great Roger Kipling impression, though. No. Oh, no, his Roger Kipling. <laughs> he toured for years on his Roger <laughs> Kipling impression. Greg, pound for pound performance. I'm going to go with uh, Saeed Jaffrey, uh, who played Billy Fish. And let me tell you why. This must have been the hardest movie in the world for this guy to make, except for the fact that probably... You want me to do what? Yeah, except I guess probably for the fact that he probably mostly was always just treated racistly in his career, so maybe it wouldn't even Mm -hmm. stand out that much for him. Maybe if we mentioned it, he'd be like, oh, yeah, that's kind of every day on the job for me. But uh, he still turns in a, a funny, interesting performance, Billy Fish has almost the depth that that would be correct to give to a character. Mm. Uh, not quite, but almost. If you made the movie about him, I think it'd be really interesting, and I think Saeed Jaffrey yeah. could have done it. Uh, and he was the only one who didn't like make my skin crawl most of the time. He, I, I think it's Jaffrey who's the reason why you're like, I want to hang out with Billy Fish more. Like yeah. he, he injects it, and, and talk about that is uh, Michael Caine had to scream at the crew to get Saeed. A chair, like the crew was also treating say Jeffrey like an asshole so cool. until That's a few so days in. That's so Michael Caine was like, "What the fuck is going on?" Man, what? at least it does prove that Michael Caine isn't really peachy. That's me nice. and a character named Peachy because that's <laughs> he yeah. sounds peachy as shit. Yeah, he's he's a real peach. Uh, yeah, he stood up for his co-star and is like, "What the fuck are all of you doing? Don't you get what we're trying to make fun of? We're not trying to really do it out here." And then he went, "Oh, what are we doing? Sorry." Yeah, so then I'll kick this guy in the butt, and he'll fall off the cliff and die, and then I'll stand up straight. At least give him a chair. Books, pound for pound for performance. I can't say the word I performance have... tonight. <laughs> performance. Uh, I also did have uh, say Jeffrey, Jeffrey as mine, but I'll also pitch up. I do think Michael Caine did a really good job playing this character 
who is like kind of disarming in his ability to like come off as like not too calculating but always calculating. Mm. Are you saying um, that Kane was able? Ch- <laughs> Greg, books. <laughs> Uh, so I, I do think that it was an interesting character choice because the whole time you hate him, but you're also kind of struggling between like, you don't always know what he's going to do next. The element of surprise was always with his, because he was kind of disarming mm-hmm. in this like calculating way of not seeming that way in his body posture or his movement, but was very much so um, in moments. Yeah. Mine would probably be Kane as well because he always Whenever he was mad, it's like, I thought we were going to be dirtbags together. But now you're saying you're a bigger dirtbag than me? Like, Mike, would you say Kane killed it? Kane killed ably. <laughs> Mike, are Mike. you the Kane to Mike Connery? Is that what you're saying? Yes, where Connery started like just going up his own butt, both the character and the actor. Thought he was a god king. And Kane was just like, I mean, not traditionally attractive but i get it if there is an interesting part of this movie i i will say the idea that sean connery is like i don't know man like i have been a god here for a while and i think i am maybe like i just now i've been looking about it reflecting on my yeah. life and i think probably I, I am god actually but the way they do it is like the two girls from book smart it's like i think i should go to college <laughs> and the other one's like what no, we were supposed to be together. No, if, I think I could do this. If the beginning was the beginning and the ends were shorter, and the middle was so much more of Connery's descent and Kane being like, "He's my best friend, and I'm supposed to support him." I don't know how. That's man. Uh, uh, I'm always. I'm going to keep saying this throughout this episode. The the problem was that Houston wanted to shit on these guys, and he couldn't help but love them, and that is what yeah. ruined the movie. Finally, we have director's signature moment, Gregory. Um, so they, uh, the gig is up, right? This guy's not God. And the people are furious because they've been subjugated. And so they're like, I don't know. It feels like we should rise up and kill this guy. Uh, and so the three of them, uh, Danny, Peachy and Billy march out in just like very proud fashion, but they don't just march out and keep going. No, they do something way prouder than that, which is they all pick up rifles and they start firing them indiscriminately into the crowd that's pursuing them. Uh, Killing holy men, religious men, like it doesn't matter. It's pretty indiscriminate. I mean, they're not really aiming. They're just kind of pointing the gun at the crowd, and all of them. And it is like scored. The guy selling caramel corn, like that guy (laughs) didn't do anything. And it is scored, like this is like a brave last stand thing or something. They're just firing into a crowd uh, of people, and I just thought, like, I don't know if he meant that to be a commentary on himself, but. That is very much a commentary on John Houston. Like that that just sort of like that it's it's just brave for a white person just to shoot into a crowd of brown people. That like that see, should that... get a big score and that should get a big dramatic send off. And it, it like you don't even see who drops, but you just know people in that crowd are, are getting shot. That's why I think this movie is so fascinating, is because we don't know and he doesn't know and they didn't know back then. Like he just what are you doing right now? And he was like, I think this is how you make a movie. But like, he was unclear about all of his messages the entire time. Or every time he tried to do one thing, he his instincts took him towards another. And I think that's crazy. Books. Director's uh, signature. It kind of speaks to both of that because mine is the scene right before Greg mentioned where, you know, he didn't know what he was doing and he was trying to do something. This is supposed to be an action adventure, or adventure action film. And he takes so long he spent so much time in so many moments building to action that wasn't even monumental action so in the scene right before they grab rifles we spend a long time watching them walk down these stairs <laughs> and walk past these crowds and it also felt like a commentary of like it just kind of it, it felt racist in that sense too that these people couldn't even communicate effectively to realize that these are the people escaping and they were right. bad and like you supposed to if they, they were, were just, like oh, watching them the walk past upper lip of the english they were like awed by that like that they could just so proudly walk so they like they didn't even know what to do they were held at bay by their gentlemanliness well and exactly. that's if it was a better movie because throughout the movie they've talked about like this is what gets us through everything is hold your head up high and bullshit but mm-hmm. that would be better by jim carrey and I was going to say Jeffrey Dunn. Jeff Daniels. Jeff Daniels, thank you. Uh, like, how how absurd it is. But the movie was just like, see, it works most of the time. Is it King and Kinger? Is that the name? King, King and Kinger. What? Ryan, did you already do yours? No. 
Two years. No. Uh, minus the long shots. Like, uh, John Houston will not waste a moment to show that he's like, I'm in motherfucking India, idiot. And or wherever he filmed this and Morocco. But here's what I love about it is that it's not just uh, shot after shot of scenery. Mm -hmm. Like he is putting action in the foreground and gorgeous in the background. And I think that's something that we lost. We have lost that with everyone from like, uh, I don't know, like Mel Gibson when he was directing movies to even like some European directors of like, oh, I'm just going to show nonstop shots of scenery in between action. And I think Houston does an incredible job. Of showing you what's going on, and then the background. And the background is breathtaking a lot of the time. He also has narration, though, which is crazy. <laughs> How many short stories have narration when they become a movie? All of them? I was going to guess none of them. But... Oh, none, none of them. None of them. Somewhere in between all and none. Yeah, I think you're going to find it somewhere in between there. <laughs> Mine, uh, so he did the Maltese Falcon. He did the African Queen, uh, Red Badge of Courage, like, it's episodic adventures. Like this guy is like, I'm telling one big story. I don't think he knows how to tell one giant story. He knows how to tell a lot of little adventure scenes back to back to back to back. I wonder if that's at all a function of the of the fact that they used to just like show the movies all day in the theater uh-huh. and people would kind of like check in and check out. So like if you could just, just bop asleep, in the theater and you got like a 15 minute episode of that movie. Yeah. Like <laughs> maybe. I also wonder how much it's a thing of like the treasure of Sierra Madre or the African Queen are based on they're all based on novellas. Yeah. Right. And he's like, I gotta I gotta fucking add shit. Like I gotta add <laughs> yeah. little adventures in the meantime. Otherwise I'm gonna run out of story soon. The final not award but thing we're doing is recommendation. If you liked this or want a better version of this, what would you do? Greg? Uh as soon as this movie was done, I uh <laughs> went to my bookshelf and grabbed Edward Said's Orientalism. Uh, nice. Orientalism is, is Said's Slaps. book about um, how the West created something called the Orient as an idea to help define mm-hmm. a diverse group of people, but more importantly, to define what it was to be the West. Uh, right. And that's what this movie is. This movie is eschewing the violence of colonialism and saying that the violence is something that is inherent to the Middle East. Uh, it is eschewing the barbarism of its people and instead saying, no, 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 it's the, it's the Middle East uh, that is barbaric. And so uh, the, the othering in this movie, which is like a scene by scene, shot by shot, constant companion as you watch this film, because it couldn't be any other way, uh, left me so like I felt encrusted. Uh, so... <laughs> So in smudged, uh, and so I went to this book as a as like a, a cleansing sort of, and I read the introduction again, and then actually looked up in the um in the in the index, uh, Rudyard Kipling, and he has like three pages about how Kipling was like really just loved white guys and thought that like yeah. the, like the white men were the best thing to happen to these these people uh, who would never like even thought of white people like that white people were the best thing when they showed up and started taking everything they wanted and imposing their will that that was just like making the world a better place. Um, and it's like, it's, it's just, it helped me contextualize why the movie mm-hmm. upset me in so many different ways. <laughs> yeah. That book is awesome. If you have the time, I agree with your recommendation. Thank you, Mike <laughs> books. Um, so I, I did not leap to my bookshelf as soon as I finished, but I, I think I leaped to some memories and I would um, recommend if you want to explore like the effects of colonialism, particularly, you know, British colonialism, I would either recommend White Teeth by Zadie Smith or The Buddha of Suburbia um, by Hanif Qureshi, who they both deal with like the after effects. So they're set later in time, but um, kind of realizing how colonialism is still moving and mm. white teeth in particular is set in um or the buddha of suburbia is set particularly in the 70s which uh works really well too so i would nice. say both of those are great both written by actually people yeah. of color so you know <laughs> can tell the story against the movies um, accurately. everybody so those would be my recommendations nice. a lot of books getting recommended this week ryan what do you got uh okay so i will go the opposite of what Max said, and I will actually, because I don't know if a lot of people have actually seen this movie. They know a couple of things, thanks to UHF and uh, Defy Bloods, which is badges or badgers. We don't need any stinking badges or badgers. 
Um, <laughs> but I'm going to say the treasure of Sierra Madre because this is, even though it was 50 years, no, 30 years before um, this movie came out, this movie does what I think Houston is trying to do, which is if you think you're a hero, you're not. You're doomed for failure. I think that mm. Houston tried to bring race into this and just really it. stepped on a 37 or 38 rakes. You know, and I do, I do appreciate him trying to do it, but I almost wish that he never tried because all he did was show how bad he was at it. This is just a bunch of white guys who are trying to like do the same thing. Um, so with Greg and McKenna's, you know, here's how other cultures make things. I can just feel free to say, here's how white people made white movies about white people. Um, and say, this is the movie that he wanted to remake, which is just the, uh, your ambition your disgusting white ambition of wanting to be in charge or king or God will absolutely destroy you in the end. I'm going to pivot away from all of you, except for the it will destroy you in the end, I guess. And uh, if you were told this was a delightful romp about two lovable con men and were bummed and that's kind of what you're aching to watch now, go watch The Brothers Bloom which is a delightful romp about two lovable con men <laughs> <laughs> where it's Mark Ruffalo and Adrian Brody being brothers and they just con everybody around them. And the ultimate con, I don't want to give it away, but one of them might fly too close to the sun and loses it all. Cause he thinks he's a con man. God King. Also, Mike, can I say uh, Nicholas Cage and Sam Rockwell in matchstick men, delight matchstick men, such a good movie. I thought you were going to say face off. Also, by, that can too, I, delightful movie. Can I say John Cusack, Angelica Houston, the daughter of this director. Who is perfect and is in no way besmirched by this. No. And Annette Benning, Also perfect. And the Grifters. Also yeah. exactly what Mike is talking about. Just delightful uh, romps. Uh, if you want to flip it a little, uh, Sigourney Weaver, Jennifer Love Hewitt. Oh, geez. The Heartbreakers. <laughs> also, Mike, if we could, Angelica Houston and Michael Jackson. And Captain mm. EO. Captain EO, That is a delightful yes. romp. Uh, Angelica Houston, Christopher Lloyd, A Hand, Adam's Family. Yes, also, that's a romp. Uh, one romp, Mike, is uh, Houston and Los Angeles in the World Series. <laughs> that one that the Dodgers lost. Houston beat them. Oh, boo. Uh, how about this one? Mm-hmm. Houston, we have a problem. Apollo 13. <laughs> Nailed it. Mike, do you I ever think- know when it's time to end the show? I think uh, five minutes ago, probably, but (laughs) uh, I'm not even going to ask how we think this would do in the bracket. Uh, Uh, Can I ask this? Sure. Do we have a shot at best actor or best supporting actor as far as the Moody's go? I don't think so. No, I'm so piss pants about this, honestly. (laughs) Uh, This movie cranked me up. My my pants only have like a smattering of pee on them, like when you (laughs) tuck a little too quickly, but... I also think that we've just already watched better actors and supporting actors. Than yeah. Maybe if this came really early, we were like, oh, okay, this is what 75 is like. It's the same oh, as 1949. Okay. You know and- what's weird? Like, I think if this movie were made in 1949, I would give it more <laughs> slack. And that doesn't seem right, right? But like, 75 was too late to be playing this game. You, yeah. You should have got this out of your system in the 50s. But that also doesn't seem appropriate. When it was cool to yeah, do. Yeah, when you were still allowed to be racist. <laughs> do you guys, have Things you guys ever re- read or seen Gunga Din? No. No. Mm-hmm. Okay. The name makes me uncomfortable already. <laughs> <laughs> Books. Before we get out of here, plug shit. All right. If you're looking to hear more of me and only me, well, not only me, but not these other three, two other delightful people, you should check out Unnatural 20s. It's a show where we don't often use our brains, but we do tell stories about ourselves and fail a lot. So if that's something interesting to you, check out Unnatural 20s, Spotify, Apple Podcasts. Um, you can find us on social media as well. New rule. No, <clears throat> new rule, Mac. Uh, every time you roll a 14, discuss mm-hmm. what post-colonialism means to you. Is that? Can we put that on the show? Oh, it would be a hit. Or I'm say sure. Holy God's Pants. I think that was the catchphrase of the movie. God's saggy uh, trousers. God, trousers. God's holy pants. God's holy saggy God's tra- trousers. God's holy trousers. That is all the time we have uh, through the rest of the bonus season. We still got night moves. We still got rollerball. We still got Sallow. Hello. So keep on watching those movies.